Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will discuss issues related to immigration in our country with special guests, Russell Smith, CEO of the Refugee Services of Texas, and Benjamin Johnson, Executive Director of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. So thank you both for joining us. It's just wonderful to be talking about this really important topic. So I'm going to set this up and we're going to go uh, to you, Russell, um, as as the representative of of really one of the uh, key states in this discussion. There are 48 million immigrants in the United States. And just for full disclosure, my dad is one of them, came over to the United States as a refugee, escaping Nazi Germany um, after his father was arrested by the Gestapo. So people living in the U.S. who are born elsewhere are nearly 14 percent of the population, and that's nearly triple the numbers in the 1970s. Texas is at the forefront of the uh, of immigration from the South and Central America. So, Russell, let's start with you. Could you talk about the impact of this debate on our ideas surrounding America and, and, and who we are? Pretty much everyone in the United States, other than natives, either are immigrants or we are the descendants of immigrants. How do people in Texas see this discussion where you are on the front lines? It depends on who you talk to in Texas. And I will, uh, uh, it's great to to hear your story. My uh, great grandmother was a refugee as well, um, escaping the pogroms of uh, Russia. Um, And so um, I can say like the vast majority of Texans are welcoming and um, are very supportive of, so the, so the populations that we work with, the refugee services of Texas, it's not necessarily like the full spectrum of Im- immigration. It is um, typically who we're seeing are the refugees, the people fleeing kind of violence and oppression. Um, and, um, you know, throughout the history of our, our country with the last four years accepted. Um, this country has been very, very welcoming um, to refugees. They um, are uh, a valuable part of kind of the community fabric. They, you know, they add to the economic um, engines of our communities. Um, and they're, you know, they generally are, are, very well kind of accepted and is assimilated into the communities that we serve. So, um, so let's talk about, um, about just that in terms of, of the people who are coming into Texas, because there, there's a lot of discussion around that. There's also right. the, the uh, conflating of the higher COVID numbers, um, blaming that on, on uh, refugees coming from South of the border. Could you talk a little bit about, um, how uh, people come to the United States and the purposes, you know, there's, there's this sense that somehow people are coming as economic refugees, which when one is living in poverty and violence, there's, there's some truth to that. Right. So, so how do you, uh, people who are coming to this country from uh, south of the border, why are they coming? So there's, you got to make a, a bit of a distinction, right? So there are like um, the, the people that we work with um, kind of our bread and butter are refugees who have been displaced from a country forcibly. They end up in a second country, typically in a refugee camp, and some portion of them get resettled to a third country, right? Um, the, the border is seeing a lot of people that are coming seeking asylum, which are similar, but it's Asylees are people who uh, kind of do their own travel, right? It's not, they don't go through kind of the UN and get uh, the, the refugee status. Um, and so they come here fleeing, you know, violence and poverty and, um, you know, even, you know, climate disasters um, and come here seeking kind of safety in, in, in the United States. And they present themselves at the border and ask for asylum. And, uh, you know, some some percentage of them will have their their cases kind of heard and accepted. And so they'll be granted a, a asylum here in the United States. And uh, Ben, from from your perspective, um, how do you see the the picture now drawn back from Texas and looking at it across the United States? It's much more complicated 
than a south of the border issue, isn't it? Sure. It, it definitely is uh, more complicated than, you know, the, the more narrow, um, really hyper politicized debate about what's happening at the border. But I think Russell makes a really good point. Um, you know, in this distinction between refugees and asylees, it's not only a legal distinction between, you know, how they're coming. It's also a philosophical distinction on, on how we address them and, and how we approach them. And we have a really strong uh, bias uh, about how things happen in the Western Hemisphere. We, we, we don't really think about or behave uh, with refugees or those kinds of situations. We don't approach it from a refugee perspective the way that we see happening uh, in Europe or uh, Africa or, uh, or, or the Middle East. I mean, when the lost boys of Sudan, uh, you know, left and fled in, 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 in incredible numbers, nobody was really asking, gee, are they economic migrants or, or, or whatever, right? There was, there was an assumption that refugees happen someplace else. We've lost sight of the fact that where these people are fleeing from uh, in that northern triangle of Central America in particular, by any other measure, would be treated as a refugee crisis. The, the, the violence against women and girls alone in Honduras has just gone through the roof. There's been a 300 percent increase in the deaths of women and girls in Honduras alone. Um, it's systematic, organized violence um, because it's headed by gang members. We think of gang members as if these are the same kinds of folks walking through uh, L.A. Uh, tagging buildings. Um, these are multinational, incredibly organized, violent uh, cartels that are controlling entire regions, much the way that the Taliban does or that other places in the country. But we're not thinking about it and approaching it as a refugee crisis. We're treating it as a border crisis. We're waiting until they get here. We're addressing the problem at this geographic line in the sand, rather than thinking holistically about what do we do to stop the flow of people here? What options are available so they could process abroad? Uh, none of those options are on the table because it's in our backyard and somehow we think we're immune from those kinds of refugee tr troubles. So what you're saying is that this is actually a business, right? This is a business. This is this this is a group of people who are organized to enslave, exploit, extract, right, move wealth, um, and they do it through violence and through death. Yeah, this is mostly tied up. up. Yeah, mostly tied up in the in the in the drug trade. That's where their billions and billions of dollars are being made, and uh, they're you know they seek to control areas uh, of the country. You know, the, in in you know Guatemala, Honduras, uh, El Salvador. Um, because of their interest in, you know, again, primarily a drugs and money trade. Um, and, and yeah, so the violence flows from that. But I mean, there's lots of other places in the world and, 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 and challenges. Uh, you know, why it's happening, I, I think, is important in addressing the root causes for sure. So we have a, a cluster that really is immigration that's driven by crime and criminality and, and violence. Um, Russell, are, are you seeing if you were to divide this, this uh, our, our immigration up, we have that cluster. And then we have people who come from other countries, maybe well off, who are immigrating to the United States. They go through the legal process. They're not in desperate straits. They might have some money uh, or they might have family members. Uh, so you go through a more normalized process between those two uh, groups. Are there other groups that you see? Yeah, I mean, so there are the ones that are displaced, um, not just the ones from kind of the, the, the triangle that you're talking about and from uh, from violence in, in Central America. But like we see like over, you know, the history of this country, um, our kind of refugee system has um, really kind of reflected the history of conflict around the world. Right. So the, the most refugees that we have seen as a country were during the Reagan administration. Um, and then, you know, we'll see, um, you know, uh, you know, there's a wave of Vietnamese after the, uh, the Vietnamese, uh, the Vietnam War. We saw, you know, Serbians and Croatians um, and Bosnians after kind of the breakup of Yugoslavia, um, you know, and it kind of really the modern um, refugee system really kind of started from, you know, Jews fleeing after World War II. So like um, it's really set up to help uh, ensure that these kind of flashpoints around the world that we are able to make a make an impact on these kind of world problems um, in a way that is humane and um, 
also then addresses some of the problems that are, are happening, right? So, you know, for instance, in the last several years, you know, one of the major places that's really blown up is Syria. And um, we started to see Syrian refugees here um, until that became a, such a politicized thing. Um, and uh, that was stopped kind of with the travel ban and with kind of some policies in Texas. Um, and my hope is that we are able to start seeing um, that population again, because that is that is a a world conflict that has not gotten any better, that the United States has a unique opportunity to help alleviate and has not. So when we, when we talk about extending American presence, we very often talk about um, our military. Right. Uh, we talk about our diplomacy. We talk about our business interests. Um, to what extent, Ben, is it important that we extend American reach through our immigration policy and, and how we, we uh, communicate with others in the world about how we deal with, with this world problem? The idea that we would use our immigration system as a, as a proactive strategy um, is I mean, that's where we need to be, but that's nowhere near where we are. Our immigration system is a defensive strategy. It's all about uh, excluding people and making sure people go through this, this filter in this system. We're missing a huge opportunity because the rest of the world is engaged in a global battle for talent, um, uh, for uh, using immigration as both uh, uh, building bridges diplomatically, as well as uh, enhancing their labor force and their economies. And the United States is still, I mean, you know, we're, we're lucky and that people are still, you know, trying uh, everything they can do uh, to get to the United States. But look, if we were really serious about this comparative competitive advantage we have when it comes to everybody wanting to come here, we'd get way more proactive. We would be out recruiting the best and brightest from around the world, not waiting for them to come to us and not putting just ridiculously inefficient uh, barriers and ineffective barriers in the way of real talent. But and I mean that in the broadest sense, I don't mean it just in the terms of the highly educated uh, uh, and you know technology. I mean, nurses, doctors, but also, uh, you know, farm workers, all of the kinds of things Absolutely, that help yeah. build a, a labor force. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the striking things to me is that, um, you know, economies cannot continue to grow without um, kind of an influx of, of workers and just kind of looking at the birth rate in this country, there is there's really no path to kind of continued economic growth without an influx of workers, right? And that's immigrants, it's refugees, it's migrants, it's, it's whatever. But um, there is no kind of homegrown um, continuation of, of economic growth without uh, foreign born. It's so true, right? If you look at uh, American uh, refugee policy and immigration policy versus the German refugee and immigration policy, of course, Germany has a history that they are still being informed by in terms of, of such policies. Um, the Germans accepted huge, huge waves of immigrants there were there were political there was some political turmoil around around that. But what has ended up happening is that many of these immigrants are powering the the economy of Germany now uh, because they also had a labor shortage, just as we have a have a labor shortage here. I'd like to um, to deconstruct a little bit more. We got a question from uh, from Stephanie uh, Congdon, uh, who asked us to just describe the difference between refugees and illegal immigrants and that sort of categorization of people. Uh, ben, you want to give it a shot? Uh, I mean, Russell will be the expert on the on the refugee uh, uh, part of it. Russell, you go ahead. Yeah, so, well, a refugee is someone who has been displaced from their country uh, through kind of war or violence or, you know, natural disaster, whatever it is. Um, typically, they'll end up in a, uh, you know, a, a neighboring country. They'll end up in a refugee camp. They can you know, they'll be there from anywhere from a handful to, you know, up to 12, 12 to 15 years. Um, they will be like the vast majority of them will either um, kind of make their life in that second country or they'll be repatriated to their former country if it's safe. About one percent of them will be uh, resettled to a third country. And until 
you know, the last four years or so, uh, the United States took the vast majority of the resettlement around the world, you know, over 75 percent. Um, and we're get, heading back to that again. Um, but then, uh, you know, it is a so uh, refugee is a, it's like a legal status through the United Nations. They go through tremendous amounts of screenings from their background and health and all of this. Um, and once they are approved, they travel to a community here in the U.S. They're, um, you know, they're resettled. They're pretty, they're expected pretty quickly to um, be self-sufficient. We even um, require them to pay back uh, the money that we spent on travel to get them here. Um, and they then become, you know, vibrant parts of our communities and, um, you know, adding kind of um, diversity and, um, you know, texture to, you know, communities throughout the United States. The real, uh, the challenge, uh, I mean, so obviously, as Russell says, if you're, you're come here as a refugee, your admission to the United States is, is legal from the minute you uh, arrived at the, at the border. Asylum can be a little bit more complex, and I think that's a little bit confusing now. There are people that are coming to the border to seek asylum, um, and, during the Trump administration, what they did is they, they closed the ports of entry. So your ability to, to come to a port of entry and say, I'm seeking protection uh, was eliminated. Uh, and not surprising when somebody's fleeing from persecution or the, you know, the threat of death, um, you close the front door, they're going to find a way in the back door. And that's why what you see is this reports of people, they come in between ports of entry, right? Crossing, uh, you know, the river or whatever it might be and instantly looking for a border patrol, a person to turn themselves into in order to make this claim uh, for asylum. Uh, I would point out that coming into the United States, however you come to the United States to seek asylum is not illegal. So once you have turned yourself over to a border patrol agent and said, I'm seeking asylum, you, you know, classifying them as a, uh, undocumented or an illegal immigrant or whatever term you want to use is technically uh, uh, incorrect. And, and I think ignores really the processes uh, that we put in place for, for people to be able to seek protection. Now, we also have this, this tendency of starving um, our, our workflows of resources to create backups and then complaining about the backups. Ben, how, how do we resolve this? Do we, do we need to um, have... Uh, a, 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 a substantial increase in the amount of resource that is dedicated so that we can process asylum seekers in a more speedy to, a speedy time frame, the, the same, uh, you know, regardless to where they come into the country. Yeah, we have, I mean, look, we have it. We need reform in the asylum process. We need reform in almost every aspect of the immigration system. The, the last time we had any serious reforms of the immigration system was 1990. Right, before the internet, for God's sakes. Um, and all that we have done since 90, 1990 is uh, employ new and more aggressive enforcement measures. We have not had a reform of the legal immigration system, the processes people uh, use to apply for asylum, the processes that people use to uh, apply for family petitions, family unification. That's how my family came here. My uh, mother and grandmother born in Australia. My grandmother fell in love with a U.S. serviceman during World War II. Uh, they got married uh, um, and eventually uh, came back to the United States. Family unification is a huge part of the uh, of the U.S. immigration system, and that is woefully under-resourced. Uh, Employment-based petition, you know, incredible backlog, shortages of visas. We have the same number of visas for high-tech workers today that we had in 1996. Um, and the idea that we really have the same demand for high-skilled uh, labor that we had in 1996 is, is ridiculous. So we need across the West, we, we talk about immigration reform. Immigration reform is at its heart forcing Congress to do what it has decided to, to not do, which fulfill its constitutional responsibility to uh, manage and control immigration in the United States. And they have abdicated that responsibility for decades. Um, and not surprising, their immigration system uh, is completely out of sync. And the, the only thing I would add to that is that, um, you know, too often we, we kind of uh, react uh, when crises arrive, right? So like you may be hearing now about, um, uh, you know, the 25,000 Afghans that are, are being kind of airlifted. And you know, so there's already a, a status called special immigrant visas that, you know, we have 
you know, welcomed a, you know, a bunch of Afghans over the years. And there, but that, you know, we're seeing that now that they are starting to flood in, right? The first 2,500 kind of moved, came into Fort Lee and they're starting, you know, more will be coming. Um, and, but that is, you know, that is action that is happening because a crisis is occurring versus, you know, uh, pre thought like uh, a plan to kind of fix something. We took a poll just just now, uh, actually two polls. One was, um, uh, do we have a, a broken immigration system? And 95% of the respondents have said, yes, it's, it's broken. Um, we also took an interesting poll in which we, we said, you know, where do immigrants uh, cluster? With uh, uh, 89% felt that, that uh, the highest uh, rate was uh, California, followed by uh, Florida, uh, New York, and then Texas. The actual order is California does come first, then New Jersey, then New York, then Florida, then Nevada, then Hawaii, then Massachusetts, and then Texas. It's interesting how we we uh, have this perception of, of where the problem is that's based on the loudest voice um, that is that doesn't necessarily align with reality in terms of, of the configuration of where immigration is actually hitting. What is going on here in our civil society um, in which um, we we are complaining, but it, instead of fixing problems, we are we're sort of signifying. Um, it, it's almost like we're 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 talking up you know around problems rather than addressing them in order to score points. Uh, Russell, I'm going to give you the first uh, cut because uh, one of the things that, that really has, has just mystified me is uh, some of the politics surrounding uh, masking intersecting with, with amnesty and, and, and uh, immigration and refugee status. What is going on in our country? I can speak to Texas, or I can't speak to Texas because uh, I have no idea what's going on here. It's uh... Um, it changes day to day. Um, and I will say to your, your last statistic on, um, kind of that where immigrants, um, go, I, I, you know, my lens is refugees. I can tell you for the last couple of years, Texas has been the largest resettler of refugees, um, in the country followed closely by California. And we're typically one and two. Um, it, it's interesting. I'm not sure I'm answering your question directly, but it's, um, you know, we do deal with the people that have kind of the legal status and come in and um, and do have to um, kind of battle the perceptions of the different statuses and the different people that are coming in. And it does get kind of wrapped up in politics. And, um, you know, we have some communities that are tremendously supportive of what we do. And we have some where we really have to work hard to kind of make the case that these these are individuals that are really adding to the fabric of our community. Um, so, so, so it has become more polarized and a little bit more difficult in the last few years. But again, our, our lens is, is more kind of with, with people who are coming here with a particular status that um, is, is not, uh, you know, is often conflated with kind of others that are coming um, to, to this country, but is, is not the same. Yeah, the thing that the thing that strikes me is that we we seem to keep the balls in the air rather than fixing things, right? I mean, we're just getting this with with uh, with the infrastructure situation in the United States, right? We're finally, 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 through multiple administrations, we're we're actually fixing something that everybody agrees is broken. I think everybody has long agreed that that our immigration system is just broken. So, um, Ben, you want to you want to take a cut at, at, at how do we break this logjam? Listen to each other's points. Yeah, look, you have to understand people's uh, fears and frustrations. I, I, I get that. I mean, the first thing about the Im broken immigration system. Yeah, yes, it's broken. I think that's not the headline, though. The, the point is, it's the, the real, you know, disheartening piece of this is it is fixable. Right. These challenges that in our immigration system, you know, this is. This is it. There are there are ways to uh, upgrade our system and get it working for us, you um, know, in, in really short order. So this is actually it's not that complicated from a policy perspective. It's very complicated, maybe from a political perspective. But this is a very doable thing. Congress just decided because the politics are hard, it's going to do what it does best, which is put its head in the sand. 
Um, the, the, uh, the people's reaction to it. Yes. Those places you just named, those probably are the, uh, those, you know, gateway cities and, and states, uh, they're still receiving the largest numbers, but the percentage increase per capita is happening in places like Nashville, Tennessee, and in North Carolina, uh, and in, uh, you know, Mississippi and, uh, lots of places that haven't seen immigrants arriving in large numbers for a hundred years. And we, if you think we have a failed immigration policy, we have zero integration policy. We don't invest in local communities being able to figure out how do we work with, incorporate, bring these people into our community? How do we leverage the power and the potential that is immigration? We're just not investing in an integration policy. They're left to fend for themselves. That's frustrating. Uh, it creates a, uh, a scarcity mentality where their gain is my loss. Right. Uh, and so I think if we're really serious uh, and this is true, not just of immigration, but a lot of other issues in our society, uh, if you're serious about addressing these problems, you got to bring people to the table. You got to paint a picture of immigration that not just an immigrant can see themselves in that future, but a U.S. worker that maybe just got laid off from an industry that got automated. They can see themselves in the future, uh, you know, in, in these in the changes that we're, we're talking about here. You know, we often say, you know, immigrants built this country. That's wrong. Immigrants were part of building this country, but they did it shoulder to shoulder with U.S. workers who had been here for a long time and had a, you know, a significant stake in those uh, issues as well. So we need to figure out how do we build this together? How do we protect the rights and, uh, and opportunities for U.S. workers, incorporate new people into our uh, communities when we need them, where we need them uh, and invest in the success of those communities? You know, it's such an important point. I mean, what a fantastic point, because. What you're basically saying is that is we're not listening to each other. We're not listening to each other's concerns and fears. Yes. We're not listening to each other's needs. We're not addressing those needs, right? The, the whole issue of if you are a laborer and, and thinking that your job is or your wages are going to be attacked, that's a valid concern. If you are hiring somebody, there are valid concerns as well. If you're a neighbor, a concern for safety, even this 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 specious idea that that COVID is being driven uh, by uh, immigrants, where there, there seems to be no factual base. We should look at that to see if there is, because, you know, new data can can tell us new things. So how do we cross those lines and deal with this integration issue? Because, you know, whether it's in, in a neighborhood where um, where gangs um, are fighting over over uh, over that neighborhood, or whether it's a business that needs workers, or whether it's um, a worker who is uh, intimidated. If we don't deal with those issues, we can't have the discussion, Calvin. Ben. No, I mean, look, our, our our partners at the American Immigration Council they have a Center for Inclusion and Belonging that I just absolutely uh, love, and, and they've started an effort with lots of other, you know, corporate partners and other partners uh, that belonging begins with us. Um, and it's about starting a conversation uh, that's way beyond uh, immigration, right? Because immigration is maybe how you came here. It's a piece of your story, but it's not your whole story. Um, and I think in, in order to live in communities, you got to under understand each other's whole story um, and, and, and begin with uh, creating a sense of belonging in community and engaging in activities and conversations that uh, transcend, you know, simple labels and get to the heart of what are we trying to do here together as a community? Um, who are we as a community uh, and, and where are we trying to go together? So I think those kinds of conversations that the Center for Inclusion and Belonging are starting are, are really critical to our long term success. This is we can't have, we can't we can't policy our way out of this conversation because the challenge is cultural, not political. Um, and, and I think we need to, to, to build a sense of culture and community. Uh, so I want to just uh, get in a, a little bit uh, on this last poll. It's very interesting. And, and Russell, I think you'll find some welcome news here. We took a poll. We said um, our immigration policy should. And then we gave a couple of uh, different choices. Nobody chose. Nobody chose the option of excluding most immigrants from entry to the United States. Um, the, the highest uh, number of, of choices came to admit um, immigrants who are refugees those fleeing some sort of crime or persecution, uh, 58 percent. Uh, also admit immigrants who have family in the United States. Um, we, we had 50 percent. Now, uh, this is a particularly select audience because people who come to these sessions are interested in this topic. But 50 percent said admit immigrants who are seeking a better life. 
Um, and then, then the whole uh, idea of either welcoming administration, uh, um, uh, immigrants and refugees, no matter the cause, and also admitting uh, immigrants based on their skills, uh, wealth, and ability to, to contribute before they, they come into the country also received several votes. So you've got a, at least in this audience, you have this consciousness that we need to look very purposely at this policy. So Russell and then Ben, I'm gonna give you the last word. Russell, if you were going to make one change, we'll gather all the Congress people, all the senators, we'll invite uh, Joe Biden to the table and we're gonna get them all to agree on one change, just one change. What is the change that we in America need to make to strengthen our civil society? I would say, um increase the refugee cap um, dramatically and the funding, you know, to follow, right? Um, it's not as, you know, and we got to realize it's not a zero sum game that like somebody coming in for a better life is adding to, to what we do and not taking away uh, jobs or opportunities for, for others. So we went from, you know, somewhere around 85,000 in the cap uh, in the last years of the Obama administration to we welcomed 12,000 people last year, right? Um, and it's going back up. And so the one thing that I would say is do what you're already doing, which is raise the cap, bring it to 125,000 a year and the funding to, to follow that so that we have those opportunities for people that are fleeing uh, violence and oppression. Ben, same question to you. If you were going to do one thing, ask everybody to do one thing, what would that be? Everybody in Congress? Uh, you know, yeah. I got to tell you, Mark, I'm just going to have to cheat. And I would say uh, it has to be comprehensive immigration reform, right? We have to recognize that, okay, yes, we need good, uh, uh, sensible enforcement, but the laws that you're enforcing need to make sense for your communities and your society and your, uh, and your economy. So you've got to adjust legal immigration uh, along the way. So those two things have to go hand in hand. So far, we're only doing the enforcement piece. We're not updating legal flows. And then politically, you've got to legalize the 12 million folks that are here. They're just the, 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 the political challenge and the animosity created by the fact that we've left our immigration system to its own devices. As a result, we have 12 million people that came around the system instead of through the system. You've got to hit the reset button on the politics by doing legalization. And then you got to update your immigration system in a way that everybody uh, feels that their future is enhanced by that. A, a truly American immigration policy that's good for American workers, good for American communities. Uh, you know, it is a selfishly self-motivating strategy of it's good for us. Um, and, and then you can have uh, a sensible enforcement. So what you're basically saying is if we all agree that what we have doesn't work, all we have to agree to do is that there are things we can do to make it better. We can't make it the per make the perfect the enemy of the good. We will never reach perfection. There will always be some change that others won't like, but we can make it better. And in order to do that, we have to be talking to each other, right? That's right. It's like my grandmother used to say about being Catholic. If it's if it's if it's easy, you're not doing it the right way, right? So I think <laughs> these conversations are hard. Uh, uh, but that doesn't mean we should should not have them or avoid them. It means we should lean into it. And that's part of what we're doing today. Thank you so much for, for helping us to understand this very complex problem. Russell Smith, CEO of the Refugee Services of Texas, Benjamin Johnson, Executive Director of American Immigra Immigration Lawyers Association. Thank, some, thank your staffs. Thank your constituents. Thank your donors. Thank your boards for the great work that you're doing in advancing uh, this part of American civil society. Attendees, thank you so much for your help. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of your questions, but it, just a, a great help. And, and let's keep going, right? We can improve things. We don't have to make it perfect, but we can make it more perfect. Have a great day, all. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.